the link for that. Stand by. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is Power for Survival. And now, here's our host, author, Bible teacher, and evangelist, Rick Talbot. Welcome to the Power for Survival. I'm Rick Talent, your host, and uh, on today's program, we want to get right into the Word of God. Turn with me, if you would, to Psalms chapter 37. Psalms chapter 37. We'll start off with one verse of Scripture. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that your Word is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And Lord, just like a servant's scalpel. Father God, your word can cut and it can excise and it can remove the things that need to be removed. It can lance those things that need to be lanced. And Lord, it can heal us of all of our infirmities, whether they be spiritual or mental or physical. So, Father, we ask you today, Lord, that your word will go forth and it will do what you called it to do, what you sent it forth to do in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. What do you want? I've heard that question asked in frustration sometimes. What do you want? You know? Get into an argument with somebody and, and, and they just keep on going and going and going. And finally, just you just have to shut them down. You just say, what do you want? What is it? What is it that's got you so wrapped up that you can't even express it and explain what it is that you want? So just shut up and tell me what it is you want. That may sound like a weird way to start a sermon. But in today's world, everybody wants something. Everybody's after something. Some people want fame. Some want fortune. Others, they want it all. I mean, you have, oh boy, I'm going to get in trouble today. I know it. You have preachers on television and in pulpits that aren't on television that wish they were, that they want to live the lifestyles of the rich and famous. They want to be the greatest. Well, what they need to be is the humblest. But they can't be humble. You know why? Because that'd be a fault. They don't have any. You see, the biggest problem we've got is we're so full of ourselves that there's no room for God inside of us. We have, we have become so pompous and full like a pimple on a teenage girl's face on prom day that we think that the whole world revolves around us. And without us, the world cannot exist. We have singers that think that they're the only ones who can sing. And if you're in country music or rock and roll, that's fine. You know why? Because you're supposed to be full of yourself. Because it's all about you anyway. It's all about how many radio station plays you can get, how many MTV plays you can get, or or GNC plays, plays you can get. It's about how many records you can sell or how many uh, hits you can get on your website or, or, or any of this. It's all about me, 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 one note. Yep. But unfortunately, in the church, we've done the same thing. And we have, we have taken that same attitude to the point that, that we fill our pulpits with people that are so full of themselves that there's no room for the Holy Spirit to guide them and direct them. And then we call up singers that are so full of themselves that you think they were Hollywood stars. And Hollywood, but it doesn't stop there, folks. It goes to the pew, too. 
I've I've seen over the years where a church would be split over the color of the new carpet. I, I was I was at a church with a where a friend of mine was pastoring, and they finally decided to remodel the church, and and they raised the money to remodel the church, and it almost caused the church split because. Well, this church been just fine for all these years. I don't see why we got to change the carpet out. I don't see why we got to paint it. It looks just fine to me. And the pastor, seminary graduate who had pastored another church before he came there. So we're talking about a pastor in his early 30s. He said, I grew up in this church. Do you realize, do you know what year the church auditorium was last painted? He looked at this guy. He said, no, he said, before I was born. When was the last time your house was painted? Ironically, the guy had just had contractors in a few months earlier to repaint his whole house for the second time in 10 years. That same church, and I hope nobody knows who this church is, but somebody may recognize the story. They had a problem with heat in these big old windows that they had in the church. And somebody had the bright idea to put these little, these little louvered, uh, doors like you'd have years ago uh, b between your kitchen and the and the yeah. and the dining room put those in those windows to cover up the windows they could close them up in the summertime so that the heat wouldn't come in and would you believe they almost had a church split over taking those out of the windows and i asked the pastor i was there busy i asked the pastor i said well what did you do with them he said oh we dumpstered all those things i thought i i couldn't resist it i i I pretended I had one in my hand. I said, Pastor, you missed the greatest fundraising opportunity on. For your gift of $50, you can have one of these to take home and hang on your wall and remember forever the louvered windows that were the louvers that were covering the windows. One of the deacons was working on the platform at the time doing some repair work. He about fell off into the floor laughing so hard. But folks, we got to put some levity on some of the insane stupidness that we do in the church because if we don't, we're going to take ourselves too seriously. And the only thing we need to take serious is the preaching of the Word of God because it's the Word of God that's going to set people free. It's the anointing that's going to break the yoke. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that's going to guide people and lead people and give them what they need to make it through every day so that they don't have to be there on Wednesday night to get their gas tank filled back up so that they can make it until another Sunday. I remember growing up in churches where, man, it seemed like, and I said this last week, I think, or the week before, it seemed like every Wednesday night it was, oh, I just barely made it. <laughs> from Sunday. Maybe I can get enough spiritual strength tonight to make it to Sunday morning. If that's all you've got, you need to get saved. You need to get delivered. Maybe you need to get delivered from yourself. So what do you want? You want fame? You want fortune? You want it all? Whatever it is that you want, there's a price you're going to pay to get it. To obtain it, you're going to pay a price. To obtain fortune, you're going to have to sell your life to a company, to a career. You're going to sell, you have to sell your life for this right here. And you know what you may end up doing? You may end up prostituting your life to the world for this and rejecting this if you're not careful. There's a price that you pay for success. In worldly success, in spiritual success. I once had a guy tell me that I needed to make, the, make a choice between working for his radio station or what he called my hobby, which was ministering the gospel. I took the keys and I gave them to him. I walked out. You know why? Because the price had already been paid. 
I already knew what the price was. And you know what? He didn't have enough money in this world to buy me. Why do I say all these things? Because the same thing is true with Christians. We want the blessings, but we don't want the commitment that it takes to receive them. Well, brother, you don't understand. You're a preacher. Oh, I understand perfectly. Because being a preacher doesn't change the fact that I'm a Christian. Being a Christ, being a preacher doesn't change the fact that I'm a human being. Being a Christian, does, being a preacher doesn't change the fact that if you hurt me, I hurt. If you say bad things about me, it hurts my feelings. And I have to go find me a quiet place to cry. No, I don't. You know why? Because I've heard it all before. You can't tell me, you can't say anything bad about me that I haven't heard before. And I figure it this way. As long as you're talking about me, you're leaving some other person alone. And they might not be as strong spiritually as I am. Why do you say that? Because I know in whom I believed and I'm persuaded he is able to take care of all of it. And I know how long I believed him. And I know how long I followed him. And it ain't been just last week. We've been through a lot of wars together. We've been through a lot of battles together, me and the Lord. <laughs> and we're going to go through some more. Let's see how this lines up with Scripture. Psalm chapter 37, verse 23. Now that I've been preaching for 10 minutes. Here's the key scripture. Psalm 37, verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Now, first of all, if you don't delight in the way the Lord's leading you, then you aren't following the leadership of the Lord. You're following your own leadership. And you will end up in disaster. Because it's either do it God's way or the highway. Oh, did I actually say that? Did I actually say that? Okay, let's see how this lines up with Scripture. Number one, the Bible does not promise us success without sacrifice. Anything worth having has a price tag attached to it. If you want that best job, you're going to have to study. If you want that best job, you're going to have to work. If you want that best job, you're going to have to commit your time and your life to it. If you want to walk with God, you're going to have to commit your time to it. You're going to have to commit your life to it. You're going to have to commit your entire being to it. Because otherwise, you'll be just like the Pharisees, full of religion and worthless to the kingdom of God. And we already have too many people like that in the church. That's why we have problems getting people to answer altar calls. That's why we have problems getting sinners to come to church. That's why we get, have problems get, having getting people to who don't know Jesus to even pay attention to what we have to say. It's because we have too many examples that they don't want to follow. Number two, the Bible does not promise us abundance. Yet it does assure us of provision. Where does the abundance come from? The abundance comes the abundance comes from taking care of the provision. Now that sounds like a contradiction of terms, doesn't it? But what the Lord puts into your hands he expects you to take care of it. You want to be wealthy? What the Lord puts into your hands. First of all, you got to go to Scripture. Proverbs chapter 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And he'll direct you in how to handle your finances too. He'll direct you in how to handle your, your personal affairs. He'll, have, he'll tell you how to handle your business affairs. And if you think he doesn't, then you need to read the Word of God. Because there's a biblical pattern to everything. And we're going to look at it here in Psalms chapter 
37, verse 23. Number one, the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord, and he delighteth in his ways. If you if it doesn't make you happy to follow the leadership of the Lord, you have a spiritual problem that, that prevents you from even being a Christian. If you don't want to do it God's way, then whose way are you going to do it? Your own way? Let me tell you from my own personal experience, it doesn't work that way. That's why so many people end up in disaster. I knew a man one time that he wanted to be a minister. Oh, he wanted to be a minister so bad. And 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 he would start off and then way got too hard. He'd go do something else for a while. Then try again, try again. You never could nail this guy down. And on his deathbed, you know what he said? I never did do what God called me to do because I can never get my act together. The problem is, for many people, it's just an act. It's something that they're going to do. Like an actor plays a part in a movie or a play. It's not their life. And it has to be your entire life. First Samuel chapter 2, verse 9. This is in the in Hannah's prayer. Samuel's mother. Here's what it says. The Lord will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail prevail for by strength shall no man prevail you will not win of your own strength you will not prevail of your own strength it takes the power of the lord working through you to accomplish anything if you do it on your own then you're on your own for the consequences you're on your own for what it costs you you're on your own to pay the price 3 John verse 2 says this, and I'm going to turn over there. I didn't have this scripture marked, so I don't have a, anything in there to be able to go to it real fast, but I know where 3 John is. It's right before the book of Revelation and the book of Jude. The third epistle of John verse 2, it says, Beloved, I wish above all that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. Now, first time I read that and it slapped me in the face, it jumped off the page and slapped me in the face, was probably the 50th time I'd read it. What is that verse saying? It says, I wish above all. In other words, my fervent wish for you. This is the apostle John saying, Jesus' brother saying this, my desire for you, my wish for you, my prayer for you is that you may prosper and be in health. But then he has to go and put a caveat on it. You'd think the guy was a lawyer or something. He has to put a caveat on it. He said, even as your soul prospers. In other words, if your soul's not going to prosper, I pray you're bankrupt because you already are. You're bankrupt spiritually. So you want to get ahead in life? I'm going to tell you the, the big secret on how to get ahead in life. You want the scripture to back it up? Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Pro Psalms chapter 37, verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. In other words, get your head out of yourself and get your head focused, your mind, your body, your spirit, focused on serving the Lord first and foremost, and the Lord will give you the direction you need. He will give you the wisdom you need. And he will open doors for you that no man can shut, and he will shut doors that no man can open. I was working as an engineer on the road, away from my family. And I wanted to be back home with my kids. But it just wasn't possible. The economy was bad. 
This was a number of decades ago. The economy was bad. Jobs were hard to come by. And I got a call from the from a company offering me the assistant chief engineer at their facility, their big television production facility and satellite uplink facility. Oh, I wanted it so bad I could taste it. The money was good. The benefits were good. Everything about it was positive. But the more I prayed about it, the more the Lord kept telling me, don't do it. I have something better for you. And I'm sitting in a hotel room a thousand miles away from my family. Wondering why. And it was hard. It was hard to call that guy and tell him, I'm sorry, I've prayed about it and I just can't do it. A little over two years later, I got a phone call. At the time, I was pastoring a church in Central City, Kentucky. Living in the basement of the church building. <laughs> 17 degrees outside. And that was the high temperature for the day. We had about six inches of frozen snow on the ground and a blizzard on the way. The church was not doing well. It was a church that was a troubled church to start with and should have been closed before I was even sent there by the denomination. But they wanted to try one more time. Sitting there, didn't know how we were going to pay the bills. This guy called me and said, uh, I have your resume on my desk. I don't know where it came from. It's, there's not an envelope attached to it. And I don't know how it got there either. But yet I do. He said, uh, would you be interested in the job as our chief engineer and station manager of our brand new television station on the sunny Gulf Coast of Texas? And he told me what the salary would be. And I literally, I literally spoke out loud. Start packing. Because I just heard the voice of God speaking. And I moved to Beaumont, Texas, Orange, Texas area. And took over as manager and chief engineer for Trinity Broadcasting's new educational television station, Channel 34, KITU TV. Working for a major Christian television network. Man, it was great. Working with Dr. Paul Crouch and our director of engineering, Ben Miller, and other people, great people. It's back in 1987, January 1987. Four months later, the headlines. Jim Baker indicted. Jim was an old friend. Mm -hmm. PTL collapsing. And I sat at my desk with tears streaming down my face because the man that had called me two and a half years early, three and a half years earlier to offer me that job was the director of engineering with PTL television network. Oh, it's a job I wanted. But the Lord said, no because he had something better for me. What he was doing was protecting me from what would happen from that association. Yeah. Why do you tell that story? I tell that story for you to listen. 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 Revelation chapter 12. Listen. Psalm chapter 1 starts out this way says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor saith in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, bringeth forth his fruit in his season. It may not be your time yet. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You see, when you want it God's way, 
you have to do it God's way. When you want it your way, you'll do it your way. But there's no promise that you're going to that you're going to harvest the fruit. There's no promise that you're going to succeed. There's one thing that you can rest assured of along the way you're going to have a lot of heartache because you're not as smart as the Lord is. None of us are. But when you learn to go to the scripture and figure out what it is that you really want and what it is you really need, your life will be changed. Is there the question being, what do you want? The question needs to be, what do you need? First of all, you need that relationship with Jesus Christ that will set you free from all the wants. They'll set you free from all of the I gotta haves. They'll set you free from all the lust for the things of the world and set you on focus to fulfill the call of God in your life. And everyone has a call of God on their life. Here's the common denominator. You know, in mathematics, you when you're trying to solve a math problem, it has to be solved for the common denominator. You've got a mixed bag of ingredients out there in the world, in your whole life, a mixed bag of ingredients, and you're trying to put them all together. But just like a mathematical equation, you've got to bring it down to a common denominator. You've got to find the common link that ties all of it together. And that's these scriptures. In putting the Lord first in our lives, period. Putting the Lord first above your job, above your friends, above your relationships, above everything else. You will discover more wisdom than you can handle. And if you don't, you'll discover more stupidity than you ever imagined you had. See, it's not about religion. And it's not about philosophy. Those things, those things will, will send you off into directions that will keep you so confused, you're looking for a corner in a round building. And you'll never find it. You'll never find true success. You'll never find happiness. You'll never find peace of mind. Because you're looking in the wrong place. The only place you can find it is when you put the Lord first. When you put that relationship with God first and everything else becomes secondary. And if you don't do that, then you're going to find something, but it's not going to be what you want. Nor what you need. You're going to find disaster. It's all about commitment and priorities. Commit thy ways unto the Lord, and he shall direct thy paths. Where do we find that scripture? Oh, I think I remember where that scripture is found. Going back to Psalm chapter 37. Fret not thyself, starting at verse 1. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Now, that kind of, kind of tells you right there, if you want to do it the world's way, if you want to do it your way, you're going to fail. Oh, you might acquire money. You might acquire property. You might acquire things. But there's something you're going to, a price you're going to pay for it that's far beyond even all the wealth that this world can, can hand you. Verse 3 says, trust in the Lord and do good. I, had a, I read, found the book at the bookstore one time, and I bought it, and I read it. The title of the book was Doing Well While Doing Good. And it was written to corporate executives. And you know what it was all about? How your big corporation, your big mega billion dollar corporation, will only succeed if it designates a portion of its profits to humanitarian and other causes. In other words, you got to give it away if you want to get it in. That sounds like a biblical process, doesn't it? Give it all to God, give it all to the Lord, and watch the Lord give it back to you 
pressed down, shaken together, and running over. But if you don't give it to the Lord first, you're not going to get the return on the investment. And the book literally went into detail on how a corporation needs to, a company needs to be philanthropic. It needs to be able to set up its own benevolence program and, 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 and supply funds to all these organizations that need help. Medical research and, and, and children's hospital and, 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 and food banks and, 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 and education programs and, and all of these things in order to set the foundation for your company to be highly respected. And the more I read that book, the more I had to laugh out loud. Somebody is using all of God's principles to tell heathens how to be successful. And you know what? It works because you can't outgive God. And if you put the principles of God's word active into your life, they always work. They're like mathematical formulas. A plus B always equals C. But serving the Lord and trusting him has to be number one or else it's not on the list. When troubles come, I'm going to tell you right now, when the trouble comes, completely Trusting Jesus is all that will take you through it. Isaiah chapter 43, starting at verse 1. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by name, thou art mine. That's where it starts. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt, they shall not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior, I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee and people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. In other words, no matter what trials and tribulations we face, how we live through them tells a lot about our true spiritual relationship. How we deal with what happens in our lives tells a lot about the depth of our spiritual relationship. If as soon as something happens, it's, oh God, why did you let this happen to me? That tells me you got about as much depth in your spiritual relationship as a puddle on a hillside. I remember a line from the story that Wendy Bagwell told about the rattlesnakes. He looks around at his wife and his daughter and says, take it easy, don't panic. Just look around and find the back door. She speaks up and she says, I already have and there ain't one. And you remember what his answer was, Brother Larry? Yes, I reckon where would they want one? The Lord always has a back door available. The Lord always has a way of escape. The Lord always has a way to deal with the problems. It doesn't matter what happens. No matter what happens in your life, it's never a surprise to Almighty God. He's the beginning and the end he already knows the future from the past. We don't. We're the only ones that time affects. Time doesn't affect God. That's why you can't predict and prophesy exactly when God's going to do something. Set dates on stuff. You know why? Because he's not, he's not tied to your clock. 
or your calendar. What do you do when things don't go right? Do you panic? I've learned from experience. <laughs> I've learned from experience. When you get bad news, you swallow hard and say, okay, Lord, what's next? What are we going to do next? Because I know you're already there and you're already on top of this. You already have everything set up for us to succeed. You already have the answers. Sound like an old gospel song, doesn't it, Brother Larry? Well, the answer's on the way. This I know. Jesus said it. I believe it. And it's so. My Heavenly Father knows my needs before I pray. And I can rest assured the answer's on the way. You remember that one? That goes back many years, doesn't it? Wasn't that the happy good ones that sang that? All of us face the same issues. All of us. It doesn't matter whether you're saved or unsaved. You're going to face the same problems. You're going to face the same issues. The Bible tells us that. Those who serve the Lord, those that serve, don't serve the Lord, they face the same problems every day. The difference is that when you serve Jesus, the Lord knows where all the mines are in the minefield. He knows where all the trip wires are. He knows where all the pits are. And he can tell us how to maneuver through these minefields of life. And it will display. Here's the, here's the key, folks. It will display our true faith in the Lord. I've seen veterans come back from war, some of them bitter and angry, and others, okay, new page of my life. Where do we go from here? Do you know what the difference is? The difference is letting the Lord lead you. The difference is surrender. Surrendering to the Lord. Here's what the Bible has to say about it. We overcome in three ways. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Number one, by the blood of the Lamb. Our salvation, our deliverance, our sanctification experiences, all of those are tied to the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And without the shed blood of Jesus Christ, there is no remission of sin. So it has to start there with a salvation experience. It has to start with giving your heart and your life to Jesus Christ and letting the Lord have all the problems because he already has the answers for them. Many people, in addition to salvation, they need deliverance. And for most people, it's not deliverance from drugs and alcohol or things like that. It's deliverance from themselves. Because they're the ones that have got this screwed up mind. They're the ones that think that everybody has to cater to them. And that's because somebody taught them that as they grew up. Some people think the whole world revolves around them. And if they're not on center stage, they're a nobody. I got news for you. Without, Have you ever watched a movie? Sister Nancy, have you ever watched a movie? When the credits come up, you normally get up and walk out, right? No, 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 no. Stick around. Watch the credits. Because on the front of the movie, they'll have the 15, up to 10 or 15 stars that are in front of the camera. And at the end of the movie, they'll show the 500 people it takes to make that happen. The majority of God's work is not done in front of a television camera. Right. It's not done from the pulpit. Right. It's done behind the scenes because it takes a lot of behind the scenes work to get everything done. Nobody ever notices that the yard of, at the church is mowed except for when the grass is making seed tops. And then they look at that preacher. Well, he must not care much for his church. Look at that. He hadn't even mowed the grass. Why they blame, blame the preacher? 
plenty of people in that church that know how to use a lawnmower. And if they don't, there's plenty of people in that church they'll be glad to teach them, including the preacher. Well, look at that building. It's, it needs a coat of paint. Well, go buy some paint and brushes or rollers and get at it. Because there's a whole lot more to serving Jesus than being in front of people and being the most important person around. And if you've got to be the most important person around, you need to be the one that cleans the toilets. Because that's one of the most important jobs in the church. I've spent a lot of my ministry time in the last 53 years cleaning toilets, cutting grass, patching holes in roofs, painting, laying carpet, <laughs> building sets for children's church, printing literature. That was back in the days before the computer. Yeah. Typesetting things using all the experience that I had to do the work of the kingdom. I had somebody tell me one time, well, you're, you're just a manager of a television station. You're not a pastor. I just shook my head and walked away. Because that, that pastor that said that had no earthly idea how many pastors walked into my office and closed the door and said, brother, can you pray for me? And talk to me about things that they could not talk to anybody else about. Nor did they were they there at 2 o'clock in the morning when we get a phone call from someone. Needing someone to pray for them. Someone getting saved. Someone needing prayer. No. I've spent 53 years in the ministry. And most of it was not behind the pulpit. I preached in hundreds of churches across America. Probably even into the thousands. But you know what? In 53 years, somebody calculate that up for me. 365 days to the year. Five would be approximately 1,600 50 would be 16,000. I preached at maybe a thousand churches out of the 16,000 or more days that I've been in the ministry. That's only a small portion. One sixteenth. Look, look on a ruler. One sixteenth of an inch is just a little sliver of an inch. But I've spent my whole life in the ministry. Number one, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Our salvation, deliverance, and sanctification experiences. And yes, sanctification is part of it too. Number two, we overcome by the word of our testimony. <laughs> Folks, Let's look at some definitions. I'm big on going to a dictionary, making sure we understand what we're saying. Testimony is a noun. That means it's a thing. It's a reality. Evidence or proof provided by the existence or appearance of something. A public recounting of a religious conversion or experience. In other words, the evidence of your walk with God. The evidence is in your life. That's how you overcome. Number three. And loving not our lives unto the death. This doesn't mean to passively give up your life and die. And say, oh well, go ahead and kill me so that I can be a saint of God. No. It means Black Hill marks the whole way. At least that's the way I see it. It means fighting that enemy. There's a principle that you hear people say, well, soldier should give his life for his for what he believes. No, 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 no. I read this from a general, an American general, and he told this to his troops. He said, 
I know you've heard this, that you should give your life for your country. But I'm here to tell you that I don't want you to give your life for your country. I want you to make the other man give his life for his country because the one that's still alive and standing at the end of the battle is the victor. So just passively give it up. I'll give my life for Jesus. No, you won't. You'll run like a scared dog. You better be tough if you're going to face life. And the only way you can be tough is experience makes you tough. You can look at my hands and you can tell I've done a lot of paperwork over the years. I've got scars from paper cuts. I've got a few scars from soldering irons, but and one purple fingernail from slamming my truck door closed on my finger. That hurt. But if you compare my hands to those of a farmer or a mechanic, you'll see I've got tender city boy hands. I don't have working man hands. Because a man that works with his hands all the time like a farmer, we're going to be scarred up, calloused. Spiritually, that's the way you need to be. And if you're going to get there, you're going to have to put some hard work into it. And that's how you stand for God. You stand when everybody else is ready to run. The story is told of Mr. Doss, who was from Ottawa, Tennessee, or from Lookout Mountain, Tennessee, who was a conscientious objector in the war, World War II. His religious beliefs did not permit him to carry a gun or to kill people. But he went into the military anyway and became a medic. And at a battle in the Pacific, when the American soldiers had retreated because of the veracity of the Japanese, this man went back to where the wounded were. And one at a time, he dragged them to safety. In the face of death, in the face of imminent death, and over a hundred men's lives were saved by his valiant efforts, yet he never fired a shot. The man was honored with the Congressional Medal of Honor. If you ever come to Chattanooga, Tennessee, you need to go to the National Congressional Medal of Honor Museum and see the stories of guys like him and Mitchell Stout from my hometown. Soldiers who, they didn't want to die, but they were willing to face death yeah. if that's what it took. And that's what that scripture is talking about. It's being willing to face death. David put it this way in Psalm chapter 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. And that, my friends, is what it's all about. Psalms chapter 37, verse 25. I've been young, and now I'm old. That talks to us, doesn't it, Brother Larry? Seems like just yesterday I was a teenager. I was thinking the other day on June the 8th, it was June the 8th, 1973, when I graduated from high school. June the 8th of this year, I'm a little over 67 years old. 49 years have passed. Where did the years go? Seems like just yesterday. I was young back then. Now I'm old. But I'm going to get older, a lot older. Yet, have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread? That's the summation of it, my friends. Provision for the journey. The Lord will provide you with the experiences. He will provide you with the means of overcoming every one of those experiences. He will provide you with what you need along the way. 
Earlier this week, I was talking about provision on man in the morning. And I remembered something that about the people that walked the Appalachian Trail. They set up points along the Appalachian Trail, which is a couple of thousand miles. I forget exactly how many thousand miles. Maybe it's 2,000 miles, 1,800 miles. Anyway, it's a long walk. It starts right down here in northwest Georgia and goes all the way to Maine. But they set up places along the way where they ship their provisions. And when they make it to that point, they can load up their backpack and go to the next point. They don't carry all the provisions from northwest Georgia to make it all the way to Maine. But they drop ship their provisions along the way. And that's what the Lord does as well. He drop ships our provision for when we need it and where we need it. That's why he can say, why David could say, I was young and now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken or seed begging for bread. You know, talking like David talked. I've, I've made the statement many times and people probably get tired of hearing it but it's something worth hearing it says the man with the experience will never be convinced by the man with the argument your testimony of walking with God your testimony of the things that the Lord has done in your life are indelibly marked in your spirit and you will never be the same as a direct result. And you will know the hand of God in your life. Others may not, but you will. I, I've experienced the Lord's will in my life. I've experienced so many things. You could write books. Have you? If not, then why? Have you not trusted in Him yet? Have you not yet given your whole life to Him? Have you not yet said, Lord, come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my sins and, and set me on the right direction. Give me the wisdom and the direction to go with my life. If you've not done that, then today is the day. Today's the time you need to do it. For today is the day of salvation. Because no matter what you ever face, the Lord will be there. I believe you, He will never forsake you. All the way. What do you want? I'm asking it a little differently this time. What do you want? What do you want from the Lord? I can tell you what He will give you. He will give you joy unspeakable and full of glory. He'll give you peace that passes all understanding. He will give you wisdom when no one else has an idea what, what to do. He will give you guidance. Most of all, He will give you provision for the journey. I want to pray with you right now. You're the only one that can answer this question. What do you want from the Lord? That's the real question. Heavenly Father, as we conclude this message this morning, Lord, we ask you, Father God, to touch the hearts that have heard it. Touch those that will hear it. And in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Lord, draw them to you. Help them to receive you and accept you as their Lord and Savior. 
in Jesus' name. And Father, help them to find a church where they can become rooted and grounded. Help them to find friends that can build them up in the faith. And pastors that will lead them and guide them in ministry. And Father, in the name of Jesus, I know I don't even have to say it. Be with them. Give them wisdom and provision for the journey. In Jesus' name we pray. If you prayed with us this morning, we'd love to hear from you. The address is on the bottom of the screen. Rick Talent, PO Box 223, Lafayette, Georgia, 30728. Until next time, this is Rick Talent saying, go with God. Because he has already gone before he prepared the way. He is your rear guard. And no matter what happens, he will always be there right by your side.